Come on, let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Let's give him a shout. He is worthy. Amen. He is a worthy God. No one like him. I want to invite you to stand with us as we sing because he has been so good. He's a worthy God. And if you believe that, somebody shout amen. amen. Come on, put those hands together just like that. Come on. Come on, everybody. Yeah. He is the lion in the land. Come on, church. Lift your voice with me. Here go.
that true today that his promises are true and he indeed is a good God come on if you believe that someone shout amen he's a good God and he is always good he is always good we bless your name today God we sing of your goodness come on let's sing this amazing love that welcomes me the kindness of mercy 
that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving and we sing God you're so good come on you know this song come on let's let it ring sing God you're so grateful today anybody grateful for the cross come on let's lift our voice sing it out sing God sing it out church your soul come on let's turn it up come on turn it up sing it out God you're so good you're so good as you are God you're so good you're so Come on, from your mouth to his ears. Come on, let's lift it up. Sing, God, you're so good. God, you're so good. Sing, God, you're so good.
more time. Lift it up, church. Sing God, say you're so. Come on, lift your voice, church. Yes, you are, God. You're so good. You're so good to me. He's good, yes, he is. my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. Come on, if you know it, come on, lift it up. Sing how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Come on, lift your voice, sing it out. Come on, if you know that he's great. Come on, let's just raise the volume on your praise right now. If you're a clapper, come on and clap louder. If you shout, shout louder, because he indeed is worthy. He indeed is worthy. The glory is his. And if you believe that church, somebody shout amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Well, hello, Crossroads. Can you feel the presence of the Lord in this place? Come on, put those hands together. Say, Lord, we are thankful. Welcome, Crossroads community, those online. Welcome to our weekend worship service and a happy post Thanksgiving. Come on, I think we can do better than that. Did y'all have a good Thanksgiving? Does anybody have any food leftovers? Raise your hands. Please, those that don't have your hands up, look around to those that have their hands up. Put, to, put those hands up again. Uh, let them know that after worship service today, we're coming over to their house. <laughs> Just mark those hands. Listen, my name is Pastor Harold, and I am so glad to be in front of you to worship the Lord together. Those online, welcome, welcome, welcome. Listen. At Crossroads, there are different ways that you can connect with the Crossroads community. If you're new to Crossroads, whether this is your first or second time, those online, just text 80123. And those that are in the seats today, you have a great opportunity to connect with other believers just go out in the atrium after worship service today, and there are some great volunteers that are out there waiting on you to be able to answer any questions. Whether it's a prayer request or whether a praise report, please go out there. They're waiting on you right after service. Guess what? I got some great news. You want some good news? Crossroads is opening and back up more and more. Guess what? Today is our first day where the bookstore is opened up. Woo! Guess what? They got a sale. Everybody say, on a sale. Up to 40% off. We ain't calling it a Black Friday. But up to 40% off. Once you go out in the atrium, into the bookstore, there's some items there on sale. Those folks will love, love, love to see your face as the bookstore has opened up. Also, the cafe next month will be opened up for breakfast. Yes! Listen, they'll be serving light breakfast, muffins, lattes, bagels, all kinds of good stuff, and it's on sale. Everybody say, you have to pay for it. <laughs> but the coffee, the decaf coffee is on the house that will be free. So some exciting things that are happening here within Crossroads. Also, we have a big, big event, huge event that's coming up. A light has dawned. 
production, a Christmas story production here at Crossroads. Yes. Yes. Get excited. So listen, check this out. They're going to show it first in East Windsor and at oh, December 5th. That's in a couple of weeks. December 5th at 1030. Those online, listen, East Hartford, it will be on the following week, December 11th and 12th. So do me a big favor. Here's your assignment. Not only are you invited, also bring a friend, bring a neighbor, bring someone that's on church that wouldn't normally come to a, a service, a worship service, but bring them to a production. Who knows what the Lord got ready and prepared for them. Yeah, would you do that? Woo! Our ushers are coming at this time. And as we are about to give, it's still a part of our worship. And I just want to encourage you as you give today, and I know they say it's Thanksgiving week, but every day as a believer, we're thankful, right? All right? And as you give today, give with a heart of gratitude. Give with a heart of thankfulness. Let's pray together, will we? Father, we are so thankful. Thankful, Lord, that you have put air in our lungs that we can breathe. And we're so thankful, Lord, that we as a people can come together to lift up your name on high. So we praise you. We give unto you, Lord, because you are worthy of all praise, because you are good, so, so good, and we are so thankful. God bless you. Let's continue in our worship. Thank you for giving on today. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Our God is so good. Amen. He has called us and he has chosen us for such a time as this.
knows us by name. God, that you have sent your son to die for each and every one of us, God. And you've called us to reach this world with your love, God, and your forgiveness. We worship you, God, and we're so grateful as we celebrate this Thanksgiving season and as we go into the most precious season of celebrating you sending your son for us. We just worship you and we're so grateful, God. We don't deserve it, but you sent him anyway. We love you, we honor you, we glorify your name. In your precious name, everyone say Jesus. Amen, amen. He's so good, isn't he? Let's give him another shout of praise. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Those of you who have joined us here in East Hartford, those of you joining us online, you may be seated. Good evening, church. It's good to be here with you in our worship time this evening. I want to say a big welcome to everybody who's joining us online. It's great to have you with us. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Have you recovered? Amen. Amen. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, all right. That's good. Uh, hey, listen, if you have your Bibles with you tonight, go ahead and take them and open to the book of John, John chapter 21. We're going to spend a little bit of a time in a story there here in just a couple of moments. While you're turning there, I want to tell you about something uh, at the church uh, that's a little bit new coming up. So you're turning to John chapter 21. Um, over at our last board meeting, our church board meeting that we had, uh, we have every, every few months we have a board meeting. Our elders and deacons get together and, and conduct the business of the church. Uh, our church board came together and established a new policy that I want to make you aware of. It'll have some impact on you in, in different ways at different times. Uh, but it, it involves all of the directors, all the pastors uh, here at our church. And so as, as we're looking uh, at, at um, I'll say it, at pastors all around the country, there is this wear down effect that, that happens uh, when you are in the ministry, because the ministry is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week uh, kind of thing. And, and that's for good reasons. You are involved in people's lives and, and, and there's, a, there's an emotional side to that, there's a spiritual side to that. And life happens all the time, right? Uh, so that's, that's just kind of the way it is. And so uh, in trying to do the best uh, that we can, and this is ha kind of happening at churches all around, uh, our church has established a new policy as it relates to sabbaticals. And so uh, what our church has said is once a minister's been on staff for a certain number of years, uh, they're going to require the minister to take a sabbatical. Uh, sabbatical, if you don't know what that is, it's, it's basically an extended Sabbath. So it's a, it's a time of rest and uh, renewal. It's a time to, uh, to seek the Lord and, and uh, connect with God. And so there's kind of a double, the intent was that there would be a double benefit there, an indi uh, a benefit to the individual and their family, as well as a benefit to the church, uh, because you want, you want your spiritual leaders to, uh, to be right and, 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 and connected with God and be at peace and, 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 and hearing from God, right? Does that make sense? 
right? So, uh, so all, that policy has been put in place, and it, what it doesn't mean is that all the pastors are going to be gone at once. Uh, so we're going to stagger that out over the next, you know, coming period of time. And each year, you might see one or two of the ministers here that are gone uh, for a time on sabbatical. And I'm telling you that now because it's going to begin this coming year with myself and my wife in January. So in January, uh, or just after Christmas time, we're gonna be on a sabbatical time, and our sabbatical is gonna be about 11 weeks or so. And so we're gonna be going for a time of rest and renewal in the Lord, and then be looking forward to coming back. And while we're gone, um, uh, preaching most of the weeks, well, Bishop Wiles is gonna be here. He's gonna be preaching a lot of the weeks along with our campus pastor and one or two uh, other, other pastors that are here uh, that are connected uh, and, and you're, you're gonna have a great time uh, with all of that. But we're, we're looking forward to that time and we'll be looking forward to getting back but wanted to make you aware of that up front. So all of the ministries will be happening in the same ways that, they, that they're doing. Uh, we're not gonna step back in any way. We're actually gonna move forward in some things. And January of this year, there's some great and exciting things happen, happening around missions uh, and around prayer. And so uh, gear up for the coming year. It's gonna be a great time. So we're gonna jump back into our series where we're talking about end times. And Tonight, you, you may ask uh, the question, well, is that really about end times? Because we're going to take a, just an extremely practical look at end times from a totally different perspective uh, than is normally looked at uh, in the concept. Uh, t- tonight, we're going to be talking about second chances. Say second chances. And, and here's how it relates to end times and why I wanted to, to wrap all this up, with our end times discussions with this. Uh, it, it, it ties together in this way. The closer and closer and closer we get to the end, the more important it is that we understand our relationship with God. And all of us have messed that out from time to time, right? All of us have messed that up. Some of us have messed it up every day of every hour of every minute, you know, all of that, right? And so this idea of second chances, are there second chances? What, where, where does that all go becomes a very important thing as we approach the end of our time here on this earth. And so I wanna talk to you here today about the story of a man who failed his best friend. The story of a man who thought his own failure put him forever beyond the reach of God's grace. And this is the story about the God of the second chance. Let me take just a moment and set the context of the story. We're going to find that in John chapter 21. But this this story we're going to look at here uh, this evening takes place after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. It's very early in the morning, and Peter and the disciples have, uh, again, been out fishing all night long, and they've caught nothing. This is not a new thing for them. They've done this before, right? And there's, as they're fishing and they've caught nothing, they look to the shore, and there's this figure standing on the shore as the morning is just starting to dawn, just as the light's just coming off. They're looking out there, and there's this figure, and, and, and there's a voice that they think they've heard before, but they don't really recognize it yet because it's coming from a little bit of a distance. And the voice says this to them, children, you, you haven't caught anything yet, have you? And then something absolutely remarkable happens. A group of fishermen actually admit that they haven't caught anything. That never happens, right? <laughs> they say no. And so the voice says that he says to them, well, why don't you try again? Put down your nets on the right side of the boat. And so so they do. And, and, And now, again, this is something that's kind of a repeated story almost. Now their nets are so loaded with fish that they can hardly lift them in the boat. But they they get them in the boat, and now suddenly they realize who the voice belongs to. Now Peter, who's on the vote, is filled with emotion. And, 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 you know, here at the beginning of our story for Peter, this night is going to kind of probably become, or morning is probably going to become a morning filled with memories. Because this event 
is a memory that, that's associated. It's very similar to something he's experienced before. And, and I'm sure that he's going to have lots of memories like that that come to him as he goes through this. Uh, but, you know, here maybe he remembers the first time he met Jesus. The story is recorded in Luke chapter 5. In that story, uh, Jesus gets into Peter's boat. And, and, and the story goes that, that Peter, or that, he, that Jesus taught the crowd that was on the shore. The, the crowd had been so big that, that he was being shoved away, and so he got into a boat to kind of get away from him and get some space and, and teach. And when he finished, he turns to Peter and he says to him, Peter, put your, put your boat out into the deep water and let down your nets. And on that day, Peter says, listen, we fished all night and we didn't catch anything. So Jesus says, hey, humor me. Just try one more time. And so they did. And on that day, their nets were so full of fish that it says the boats began to break and started to sink. They had to call another boat in to help them. You know, help us, we're, we're overloaded here. That's the very first time where, where Peter was just meeting. And when that happens, Peter's response in the moment was, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He understands immediately that there's something different about this guy. And he, he just kind of bows, his, you can see him bowing his head and say, go away from me, I'm a sinful man. He understands who he is in, in response to all of this. And, and, and isn't it true that broken people sometimes pray that prayer? I mean, it's not really the desire of his heart. Mostly it's fear talking in Peter. But his very first prayer to Jesus was, please leave me, I'm a sinful man. I hear that from people all the time. Uh, we'll, we'll talk to them about coming to church and they'll say, I, I can't even walk in the doors because of how I feel and who I am. In that moment, Jesus said, listen, I know who you are, it's, it's okay, but I've got a plan to help you with that problem. In fact, I'm gonna give you a new life. I'm gonna teach you to fish, instead of for fish, for men, and everything's gonna change. This is the Lord of the second chances. And here at the beginning where Peter is saying, go away from me, I'm unworthy, Jesus is saying, no, 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 that's who you were, but I've got another plan. Amen. Here in John chapter 21, Peter realizes first who the voice belongs to. And in typical Peter fashion, go read about it, uh, because Peter's this impetuous guy, and he just jumps into the water and swims to shore because he can't wait for the boat to get there, right? M maybe when he does that, I'm sure when he does that, he probably remembers another time when he had jumped out of a boat, the time where he walked on water, at least for a few moments, but then his faith gave out, and he sank. You see, he failed that time too. But the Lord of the second chance rescued him. On this night, Peter gets to the shore and Jesus is gonna fix breakfast for them. He's, he has this fire started already, Jesus does. Let, let me read you from the story because now we're kind of coming to the place that we're at. John chapter 21, verse number eight says this. The other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, but about a 100 yards off. And when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Now, I want you to pause for a second because we, we normally pass by this detail, but uh, those of you who have read this verse many times before, let me ask you to notice for a second the detail that John puts in verse nine where he says, it's a charcoal fire. You see that? Why do you think John puts that specific detail? Because that's, that's, that's a little bit much. It's, it's unnecessary almost. Well, it's interesting at least that in John chapter 18, as Jesus is taken to be crucified, Peter is asked three separate times if he knows Jesus, if he's a follower of Jesus. And when he's asked, John tells us that he's warming himself beside a charcoal fire. And on three separate times before this charcoal fire, Peter says, no, I don't know him. I'm not one of his followers. No, I don't know him. 
I'm not one of his followers. No, I, I don't know the man. He, I, he's, he's not, I'm not with him. And in this moment on the shore, at this charcoal fire, surely Peter remembers the great failure of his life. He had had a lot of failures, but this one was surely his greatest. Uh, sometimes in life you have one of these moments that just feels irredeemable. Surely Peter remembers when he stood beside the fire and denied his God three separate times. Breakfast is over. They're standing there together, Jesus and Peter, and this is only days, this is only days after the denial, days after the crucifixion, uh, shortly after the resurrection. So not far from the bad moment, right? And Peter is so vulnerable in this moment. He waits to hear the words of Jesus. If you can imagine standing there after going through that yourself, you had just denied him right as he's headed towards being crucified. And now you're standing in there. He's, he's, he's like a prisoner waiting for the sentence of the judge because he knows that Jesus knows all. He, he knows that Jesus knows how he's responded. And then Jesus says it. The question that would wound him to the heart. The question that would probably carry G Peter all the way to the place of his grave. The question that I'm here to ask you Tonight, John chapter 21, verse 15, Jesus is standing there with Peter. Verse 15, it says, and when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? It's interesting the things that Jesus does not say here. He doesn't say, Peter, are you sorry for what you've done? He doesn't ask, Will you promise never to fail me again? He doesn't ask, have you built a large ministry for me, Peter? Have you given away a lot of money? You know, all the kinds of things that we could come up with for Jesus to ask. It's first things first. Peter, simple question, do you love me? And now Jesus kind of becomes the vulnerable one in the situation because he's waiting on Peter's response. You know, when you ask this question, do you love me? You put your heart on the line. And that is the nature of God. Over and over with us, he puts his heart on the line with you, asking that question day in and day out uh, with, with how we live our lives. Do you love me? I remember 25 years ago asking a similar question to my wife, Amy. Do you love me? You remember, hon? <laughs> Will you marry me? Are you willing to commit your life to me? And I can tell you, because I've experienced it, it's all on the line. You know, your heart is just kind of hanging out there and the seconds tick by. It can only be a couple of seconds, but it feels like an eternity as you're waiting for a response. Jesus is standing with Peter before this little fire and Peter's already responded to that the first time. But verse 16, he asks the question a second time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? He doesn't even use the old nickname Peter anymore. He uses his formal name, Simon, son of John. It's as if to say, I'm not gonna even presume the old nickname on you anymore. I'm not even gonna presume that you want that relationship in that way anymore. I'm not even gonna presume, presume that you're Peter, who I named that to uh, in renaming who you are. Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you for the second time in response. And now one more time, verse number 17, Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved, it says, because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Three times this, this exchange is completed until Peter is hurt to his core. He doesn't know what we know, that in this process, he is being healed 
by the Lord of the Second Chance. And this story is crafted so very carefully because not once, but three times Peter stood before a fire and three times he denied Christ his Lord. And now not once, but three times he stands before this fire and Jesus allows him to respond in the positive way. Yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus responds to each of those three answers. Every time he says yes, each time Jesus says, then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. That is, Peter, then get back in the game. I know how you're feeling right now. I understand what you're going through. I know you feel like a failure. I know you feel like everything's gone wrong. But here's what Jesus is trying to say. I still want you, if you love me, if you're still here, then you're still a part of my family. And if you're a part of my family, let's get to work in the family business. You need to be at work doing what I am called to do and what I've called you to do. And now today, Jesus says to me, he says to you, he says to whoever would hear whatever you've done, You may feel inadequate because of mistakes that you've made. Because you don't feel like you have the right gifts, the right talents, the right abilities, or any of these kinds of things. You may feel inadequate because who you have been, what you have done, how you've even rejected God. But Jesus would say, you're still the one that I've created to be a part of my family. And I've placed passions in your life. And I've given you gifts and talents. And you're not inadequate because of your mistakes. You were made for a reason. And Jesus, the Lord of the second chance, says, you are forgiven. Now go out and discover who I've made you to be and do my work. And so today... I'm echoing those same words to all of us who are here. All of us, every one of us who are here. God has made us uniquely, wonderfully, and special. He's given us passions inside of our hearts that aligns with with his word and his will. He's given us gifts, and he's told us to be involved in serving one another, in teaching one another, in loving one another, in, in encouraging one another, in shepherding one another. Some of us are here today, and for whatever reason, let's just be really honest. You've got this sense of inadequacy, or this sense of guilt, or this sense of failure, and so you've been, you just kind of been holding back. If that's you here today, Jesus is saying to you, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Do you love me? If the answer is yes, then build my church, build up the people who are my children. This is the Lord of the second chance. And no matter how big your failures are in this life, I doubt they're much bigger than Peter's were. When I was a kid, whenever we were doing something and we didn't like the outcome, whenever we'd mess up, we'd say something like, hey, I wanna get a do-over. Can I get a do-over? Let, let, me, let me get a do-over. I want, I want a do-over. If you're, if you're playing golf, which I like to, to do, they, they actually have a word for it. They call it a mulligan. If you don't like your shot, you know, you just kind of duck hook it into the woods or something. You just you say, listen, I'm, I'm going to take a mulligan. You drop the ball, don't count that one, and, and just play it over. You, you, just, you just take a mulligan. It's a do-over, right? I, I remember, I think I've told this story before, but it's one of those huge moments in my life. I remember I was playing with my dad in Oklahoma and we, there was this rainstorm and it was a tournament we were in. And for whatever reason, he was, he was in the, the group that was in front of me. And it was raining so hard, I could barely hold on to my club. Uh, in fact, the first time I swung it that night, my club went flying out of my hands like 25, 30 yards in front of me, which reminds me, uh, Jack Armstrong was down here. Yeah. I was playing with him one time and I was standing behind him and he let it go and it came back and hit me and like bounced off like 15 yards away. Isn't that right, Jack? I'm, I'm chucking you under the bus. I'm sorry, Jack. 
But Jack wasn't with me on this night, and it was wet, and you couldn't hold on. It wasn't on purpose. You can have a do-over. It's all right. I can hardly hold on to, to, um, to the club, and it's raining, and, and I hit this shot. I can still remember. I hit this shot, and the ball, the green was like 200 yards away, and I hit it really well. And, and it was headed towards the green, and, and, and the guys with me were, were straining our eyes because it's a little dark because it's cloudy and the rain's coming down, and you can't really see exactly where it's going, but we could tell it was headed just to the right of the green in front of us. Well, just to the right of the green in front of us was the tee box for the next group, and there were two golf carts parked next to the tee box. And all of a sudden, we heard this sound that sounded like a cannon going off, like an explosion happening. And I just cringed. Now, my dad was playing in the group in front of us, and my golf cart ball had hit the roof of the golf cart that he had been riding in. He and the rest of the group, I think, were standing on the tee. Do you remember this, Dad? He's standing over there. You remember this. He's cringing right now because he knows what I'm about to say. When it hit the roof of the golf cart, it exploded through the roof. And this little tiny golf ball left about an eight inch hole right in the top middle of the, of the golf cart. What made it even worse is my dad was riding in that cart, not at the time, but he was riding with a guy who he was playing with and the guy owned the cart himself. <laughs> and so for the whole rest of the round, they had to complete the round with a big hole on top as rain is just pouring down on top of them. <laughs> and now the guy knows that it's the son of, you know. Right then and there, I was wishing for a major mulligan. I wish that I could make it all go away. I wish that I could have a do-over and just like take it all away and go back. Isn't it true that all of us from time to time, what we need is a do-over? Yep. Would, wouldn't it be great yep. Yep. if we offered do-overs to each other on a regular basis? You're in an argument with your spouse, something comes out terribly wrong and, and your spouse says, listen, honey, it's okay. Take a do-over. Can you imagine that happening? You cut somebody off on the highway Instead of having somebody honk at you, making all kinds of gestures, they, they, they catch up to you at the next light, pull up next to you, roll down their windows, put up their hand and say, just take a do-over, it's okay. <laughs> a pastor here at the church preaches a really bad message. Instead of going home and complaining about it, you know, you come back in and you tell them, it's all right, pastor, take a do-over, no problem, you know. Think about the people in your life who have wronged you, who what they really need is something they don't deserve. We ought to be a community where people experience amazing grace. Not that they deserve it, that's why it's called grace. We ought to be a community where people experience amazing grace on a regular basis. Here's the point. When Peter least expected it, and he did not deserve it, Jesus is standing by the fire and he says essentially this, Peter, take a do-over. Take a mulligan. You denied me three times. I'm gonna give you the opportunity to declare your love for me three times. I made you for a reason. I made you to be about my work, to minister to my children, to show mercy, to show hospitality, to lead, to teach, to help. To all who fail, Jesus says this, take a do-over. And when you take a do-over, get back in the game. To those of you who least expect it and who least deserve it, 
in the book on leadership by Ward Barnes, there's a story of a promising junior executive years and years ago at IBM who's involved in a risky venture for the company. And, and as he's involved in it, he ends up losing, this executive ends up losing $10 million for the company. That's a hit, right? And so he's called into the office of Tom Watson Sr., Jr., who was the founder of IBM so many years ago. And he's overwhelmed with guilt and he's overwhelmed with fear. And so he says, listen, I guess you've called me in for my resignation. Here it is. I've already got it written out. I resign. And Watson says, you've got to be joking. I just spent $10 million educating you. I can't afford your resignation. (laughs) You'll never do that again. The night before Jesus is betrayed, He meets with his closest friends and he tells them what's going to happen. Jesus predicts that they will desert him. And Peter stands up and he says, not me. I'm not going to desert you. All the others may leave, but I'm not going to do it. And before the night is through, Peter three times says, I don't know him. I don't know the man. He means nothing to me just because he's afraid. With all of this, Jesus could have stood by the fire and expected the resignation, but he didn't. Instead, he said, you've got to be joking. I can't afford your resignation. Why? Because I've just invested my life in you. I've just given my life for you. I've got too much invested in you. If you hear nothing else tonight, hear this. The church is a place for people who need do-overs. They need do-overs in the families where they live, where they mess things up. They need do-overs in their jobs. They need do-overs in their finances. They need do-overs in their relationships with one another because when you're a family like we are here, we are going to mess things up. It's a place where people need to be redeemed because redeeming is what God is into. It's what God has been into from the very beginning of time with his people. That's how God's people got started from the beginning. God came to an old father named Abraham. Abraham who had laughed at God's promises. And God says, Abraham, how about a do-over? Let's start a do-over nation, Abraham. Let's make a do-over world. God came to a a, a little boy named David who became a king, but then he committed murder and adultery. God comes to a prophet named Jonah who ran away and eventually had to be rescued from the belly of a fish. God comes to a a persecutor named, named Saul who mocked his son and terrorized his people. God comes to desperate, lonely, sinful people. God comes again and again And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And God says, why not let me give you grace? Why not let me give you a do-over? God is into redeeming. He's the finder of directionally challenged sheep. He's the searcher for runaway uh, runaway coins. He's the embracer of prodigal sons. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. And his power has no boundary that's known by mankind. God redeems and he redeems and he redeems. And he is here with us even right now. And he would love to redeem us. He is the God of the second chance. He is the God of the do-over and the mulligan. Just one question that he would ask to you tonight. He would say, do you love me? Why does he say it? Because he loves you. Do you love me? Do you love me? And if your answer is yes, then his response is, then get in the game. Go out and get involved 
in building my church, encouraging my people, extending grace, and helping us to become the picture of Jesus Christ in this world. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, one more time as we come to the end of one of our worship times here together, I wanna pause and thank you for your word that leads us and guides us into all truth. Thank you for your spirit that is with us and, and helps illuminate your word to us. Father, I pray right now that you would open our ears to what your spirit would say to us. I want to ask you as, your heads, or as you're standing there with your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment. Are you here tonight and you need a second chance? Do you have sin in your life? Ways in which you have rejected God. You've gone your own way. You've, you've been your own Lord and so you've done life your own way but, but it's caused you to go against God and it's created a separation between you and God. Are you here tonight and you need a second chance? He is the God of the second chance. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to invest his entire life for you. If you're here tonight and you need a second chance, I want to encourage you right now, where you're at, where you're standing, to reach out to God in prayer. Whisper a prayer and just say, God, I need a second chance. I need you to forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. I love you, but I want to understand how to love you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Would you forgive me tonight? The Bible says that when we reach out to him in faith, that he's faithful and just to forgive us because Jesus paid for our forgiveness with his life. And so, so all of heaven rejoices. Listen, if you prayed that prayer tonight, I wanna to ask you, before you leave this place, before you leave this place, tell somebody about it. Tell somebody, say, I prayed this prayer. I've I asked for a mulligan. I asked God to forgive me. I asked for a second chance. And, and let them encourage you. I, I promise you, everybody here wants to celebrate with you. One more thing I wanna ask you as we're standing here tonight. I wanna ask you the question, and, and I just want you to ask you to whisper it. Not even, not even so, so your neighbor can hear it, but just whisper it very softly. As if Jesus is asking the question tonight, here it is, do you love me? What's your response to him? Would you respond to him right now in that? I'm gonna ask it a second time. Do you love me? This is Jesus saying it. Would you respond with a whisper? Let me ask it a third time. Do you love me? Now hear this. For everyone here whose answer was yes, Jesus' statement back to you is, then get in the game. Get involved. Take care of the children of God. Find your place to get involved. Don't wait for somebody else to come to you. Find your place in the community, serving him, feeding his sheep, encouraging others around you. Be a part of doing that. God made you unique, wonderful, and special, and he has a place for you in his kingdom. Let's be involved in what's going on for his kingdom and his sake. I want to invite our leaders who are here to come down here to the front to be ready uh, to pray as, as we come to a conclusion in our service. One of the ways that individuals are serving here through, through leading and praying. Uh, if you're here tonight and you have a need that's in your life, uh, can, can I just say our God is the God of second chances. He's the God of miracles as well. And so if you're here tonight and you have a need that's in your life, I want to encourage you not to leave this place before you take a moment and, and come down to the front. Bow your heart, bow your knee in, in prayer and, and give that need to the Lord. Or maybe have one of the leaders that's here pray with you, pray for you. That's what the Bible tells us to do. But let God touch you in a unique way and maybe even begin a 
a miracle in your life today going forward. Our worship team is going to lead us in one last song as people come, but the altars are open. God bless you as you come today. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, cause you're the one that guides my heart. Come on, sing that again. Lord, I come. Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you. together tonight our need for you. We recognize our need for you. And at the same time, we recognize that, that you have intentionally said to us that you are going to place a need for us within us. And that is because there are people all around us today who don't understand or even recognize their need for you, their place today separated from you. And so you have, you have placed within us the call to go out and be salt and light in the world that's all around us. Help us to do that, Lord God. Help us to bring your love and your light to everybody around us who needs you today. Let your name be lifted up for you alone are worthy and we give you praise. Amen and amen. Crossroads family, thanks for being with us. You know, I consider us a family and part of that is hearing from each other. You've just heard a lot from us. We want to hear from you. A moment ago, you saw a number to text if you need someone to pray with you. Feel free to send your name over for anything so someone can call you and pray. If you want to take the next step in your journey of following Jesus, then text the word BEGIN to this number, 80123. Or if you just want to get connected, we also have a digital connection card so that we know who you are. Crossroads, we want to be a part of your life and we thank you for taking time to worship Jesus with us. We look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.